We are looking at the arguments of the neo-evangelicals against the world-denying position. We looked at one argument last time. They present to us the problem, how do you deal with the so-called world-participating text? of the social justice preaching of the latter prophets, the social justice actions, the earthly life and ministry of Christ, and the call to missionary activity for the Christian church. How do you deal with those? If you're a world denier, those three things seem to point toward world affirmation or world participation, so how do you deal with those? Then we're going to come to a second argument this morning, another argument by the neo-evangelicals against any groups that are well, remains of fundamentalism, because the fundamentalists have always been separatists, remember. They've always been world deniers. Before we do that, we've gone over so many books before. I brought a few more. We're going to do it real quickly. Uh, but I had told you earlier that I would show you what the fundamentals look like. I'd given you a history earlier of this set. It came out two wealthy California Christian layman businessmen got together this and sent out millions of copies of this. They were originally in 12 volumes to pastors all over the United States and over into Europe as well, trying to combat ex especially liberalism and the social gospel movement and things on that order. I have it in a four volume set. You see it's entitled The Fundamentals. And I'll leave them around if you want to look through them. They make very good reading because although they were written by scholars, basically two pastors are on a real elementary level. But they have lots of divisions. Oh, I'm already in the last one. Um, here's a division called Modern Thought. Um, the Decadence of Darwinism, the Passing of Evolution, Evolutionism in the Pulpit. Uh, they've got a section entitled Isms. Um, Mormonism, Christian science, they call it Eddyism, spiritualism, and they've got a lot of teaching about uh, the doctrine of scripture there. But anyway, you go through this and you'll find sermon after sermon on the fundamentals of the faith, the second advent of Christ, the virgin birth, substitutionary atonement, you'll find lots of sermons on that. And people probably underestimate the... Um, extent of the influence of these volumes right here. A lot of what kind of lay Christians, whether lay Christians that, that came out of an evangelical background into the charismatic movement, didn't come out of an evangelical background, still in an Episcopalian church, whatever, they have been influenced by these volumes. These volumes were the ones that spread all of these various views about inspiration and salvation by grace. This has a lot of doctrines here. Justification, sin, original sin, grace of God, regeneration, conversion, reformation, evangelism. This looks like it must be all about theology. Then a whole lot about missions. Um, is Romanism Christianity? Rome the antagonist of the nation, the true church? So a lot of teaching against Rome and so forth. I'll just send those around and you may want to take a look at those as they go. Uh, Baker came out with those a couple of years ago in a reprint. Um, I assume that they could still be picked up from Baker. I think I might have paid $17, you know, for those four volumes, which is a tremendous buy. I don't think CBD carries them, though. I have never seen them there. Other books that would give you some history of what's been going on. J.I. Packer's little paperback, Fundamentalism and the Word of God. Fundamentalism. <coughs> Notice he's got fundamentalism in quotation marks there. It's an interesting discussion about various things. But it does deal with the subject of the interpretation of Scripture and its inspiration. A new book, I just finished reading, it just came out, but because it's a biography, it gives you a lot of history. See, remember, Confessions of a Theologian by Henry is an autobiographical account. It'll give you a lot of his inside information on the history of the movement. This is entitled Five Evangelical Leaders by Christopher Catherwood. One of the evangelical leaders here is um, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He is the grandfather of Christopher Catherwood. So no surprise that more space is given here in the book to D. Martin Lloyd-Jones than any of the other men. It's written by his grandson. Um, of course, over here you've got a picture of John Stott. We've mentioned him, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. By the way, three out of five of these are English 
pastors or theologians. Um, Francis Schaeffer, an American, although he's lived most of his life in Switzerland. J.I. Packer, professor of theology up at Regents, and he's taught down at Gordon-Conwell, and Billy Graham. The history of these men, their conversion, their writings, and things like that. And when you get into, well, I hate to even leave Billy Graham off. He's had such a role to play. When you get all these men together in a book like this, these are some of the foundational leaders here that go back, way back into the 30s or 40s or even 20s. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones was born back in the 1800s. So you have an interesting history there. Of course, you've got Schaefer's book, um, How Should We Then Live, subtitled The Rise and Decline of Western Thought and Culture. Now, this book happens to hold a special place in my heart because I remember as a boy, must have been in my early teens, before my conversion, um, Frankie Schaefer, who is Francis Schaefer's son, Francis Schaefer's now dead. He died at Mayo Clinic here not that many years ago, 1982 or 3 or 4, somewhere along there, died of cancer. But his son, Frankie, got together with him and some other people to produce motion pictures based on the philosophy and the writings of his father, Francis Schaeffer. And they were a phenomenal success. They've been seen by presidents and congressmen and senators and everything. And I saw this film. It was brought to our Presbyterian church back when I was in my early before I was converted, entitled, How Should We Then Live? And I remember it had a profound impact on me. What you'll find here is a lot of what I've been discussing, the history of culture, the history of the Renaissance, uh, the rise of atheistic philosophical skepticism and so forth. Um, so that's an interesting book. And I'm sure there are some more things in here that I haven't given you that, that I'll be giving you. A lot of pictures in here, a lot of it into art. And, but anyway, I thought you'd be interested. The Rise and Decline of Western Thought and Culture. Evangelicalism and Modern America, edited by George Marsden. You've got many articles in here by people like Noll, David Wells, he was my theology professor in seminary, uh, Nathan Hatch, Richard Ausling, he's the religion editor for Time magazine, but he's a Christian and evangelical who started out with Christianity Today, so forth. Evangelicalism and Modern America. And then of all that I've just shown you, I would only recommend that you buy one. <laughs> if you want to buy the others, buy it. This is a book that's highly useful. Fundamentalism and American Culture, The Shaping of 20th Century Evangelicalism from 1870 to 1925 by George Marsden. It is a highly readable book. Um, and let me just mention three names here for you right now to kind of get down. Um, Noel. I forget all their first names, Hatch and Marsden, are three <coughs> church historians that have been producing. By the way, notice this was edited by George Marsden, this book. One of the writers, Mark Knoll, Nathan Hatch. Three church historians who are producing a lot of material in the last few years, they have put out a lot of material that is um, chronicling the, the early rise of fundamentalism, the evangelical movement, and all types of things like that. One of them, let's see, Marsden's professor at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I forget who is where now. One of these is a professor at Notre Dame. I forget which one, so I hate to even take a guess. The other one's a professor at Trinity Evangelical School in Deerfield, Illinois. But one of them is from Notre Dame, but he does come from an evangelical background, and he writes with the perspective of an evangelical. I read this book not that long ago. I think it's a fairly new book. Just been out a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, and it's just absolutely fascinating. Notice the time period from 1870 to 1925. It'll do, it'll set the background for something like that four volume set on the fundamentals there. Fascinating book that's almost kind of like a must reading, knowing what took place in American Christianity around the turn of this century and what were the roots of what took place. 
And those are the things that produce the situation that we have in the world today. It's very readable, I think. It's an easy book to read, but it, it's a paperback packed full of information. Packed full of information. Okay, enough on those books then. I'll send that one around, I guess, if you want to take a look at that. Now, let's then come to the second argument. That was just to bring you up to date with a few more books. Second argument, we've looked at one, the how do you deal with the world participating text. The second argument that we want to begin approaching this morning is their charge of Gnostic dualism. to our interpretive account. In other words, they're charging us with being Gnostic dualists. Sounds like a heavy charge to me. I don't know if I want to be a Gnostic dualist or not. Now, do you remember anything about the old, early church history era of Gnosticism? What do you remember about Gnosticism? All right, secret knowledge. That's the first thing that it's known for. All right, that is not what they're saying. So that's good. We want to point out the first thing it's known for is the Gnostics claim to secret knowledge, an esoteric view that only the initiates to the religion could have and no one else could have. That's not what they're charging us with. What's another tenet of Gnosticism? Remember the big contrast they want to make between flesh and spirit. Spirit is good flesh is evil. And that's where we get this term dualism here. Sometimes Gnosticism, the old heresy, is simply referred to as dualism. There have been dualists in church history from the beginning right down through the ages. People called dualists who believe that all flesh, in other words, all matter is evil and all spirit is good. So I'm not talking about the basic knowledge part of this air, but the spirit, flesh, spirit matter good evil contrast also called dualism that's inherent in Gnosticism now do you see what type of charge they're making then they're making this charge of us what are we we're world deniers what do they say what do they equate that to all right you're like the ancient Gnostic dualist that you're saying anything out there that's matter anything in the world anything that's flesh anything you can see is evil and the only thing that you think is good is spirit and so that, you need to understand that. That's what we're going to be talking about for the next hour here. That is the charge that they make of us. That if we're saying that the world is evil and only spiritual matters matter, only spiritual matters are good, then are we not Gnostics making an unwarranted distinction between flesh and spirit? Well, that's an interesting charge, and I think it's fairly legitimate, and it's one that needs to be discussed, because I think that this charge could be leveled. It could be leveled legitimately against certain groups of world deniers. It all depends on what the philosophy behind world denying is of any particular group. But I think that this is an appropriate charge and I think that it's one that needs to be answered. And I think because of the philosophy we have behind world denying, it's one that we can answer. Well, I would say in the first place, true. Um, there are certain extremes among world deniers that we need to avoid. Str extremes such as mysticism. The mystics were the people who looked to the world above. And Adventism. These were the people, the Adventists were the people who looked to the world beyond. I think these are two extremes of world denying that need to be avoid, avoided. We must neither be mystics nor Adventists. Now you see the mystic, he looks around him and equate, he equates all that he sees with matter and matter due to do Gnostic dualism is evil. And therefore, what does he do? The mystic just tries to set himself apart, somehow leave the world, and somehow spend all of his time simply meditating, contemplating, 
uh, reasoning, thinking, praying, things on that order. In other words, you would never accuse a mystic of being a world affirmer. You would never make the mistake of accusing him of being too involved with the world. If anything, he's not involved enough. And so what they're doing, the neo-evangelicals, they're making a charge of Gnostic dualism that we fit in one or the other or a combination of these two or maybe a third group plus a combination of these two that's, that's not scriptural. We're too mystical. We look around and say everything's wrong. We ought to just spend their time thinking, contemplating, meditating. So the mystics look to the world above. They want to turn off channel W, which equals the world. They want to turn <laughs> off channel W by turning to the allegory of the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon happens to be a book that would fit them, the mystics, very well because they would interpret it allegorically and you've got this love relationship between the mystic and Jesus. The mystics, people like um, Bernard of Clairvaux and uh, Meister Eckhart and the mystics that we've had down through the centuries, uh, they would say that what life is, life is loving Jesus. You can't do that when you're contaminated with the world. What they strove after was such things, you'll see this in church writings, is the beatific vision. Ever heard of that term before, the beatific vision? Or a step higher, the visio dei. Surely former Catholics have heard of these terms. The beatific vision and the visio dei. Those are big terms from mysticism. Well, you see, the mystics are just concerned about meditating, contemplating, thinking about matters. This means just what it says, the beautiful vision. Beatific vision is the beautiful vision of loving Jesus. And through contemplation, separation from the world, escapism from the world, through contemplation, you can come through the inner man to an experience of having a beautiful spiritual vision. And then if you contemplate well enough and you go beyond that, you can actually have visio dei, which is the vision of God. Now that's not a vision like we think of vision. It's the, it's the incoming and, and the, the rapturing of the soul of the mystic into the eternal divine beauty of God. Uh, thus life is loving Jesus. It's almost easy to say that these people were, were something of the forerunners of uh, Kierkegaard's existentialism because so much is based on just the inner man. And you never can really nail down exactly what it is they're talking about here. The visio dei. They don't really mean that you ever see a vision of God like John saw in Revelation 1. It's just that your soul becomes united with the deity above, thus providing a vision into heavenly matters for you. And you do that through mysticism. Another extreme to avoid, Adventism. The mystics look to the world above. The Adventists look to the world ahead. They too wish to turn off channel W, the world. But rather than turning to the allegory of the Song of Solomon, of course, they would turn to the apocalypse of the Apostle John, the Adventists. These, of course, are the people who are so intent on the return of Christ, hence Adventists, the second advent, that they have chosen to totally repudiate, reject, and escape from this world. And they do it, they escape through their interpretation of the apocalypse of John. Both of these groups then follow the pattern of reject, separate, and escape. I would say they both follow this pattern of reject. You reject the world, you separate from the world, you escape the world. You escape either through mysticism or Adventism. Now I think that every Christian my, my, even my church history professor will argue in favor of this as well. Every Christian should have a mystical aspect to them because life is more than just nuts and bolts of um, mental equations or whatever. There certainly is a Christian aspect in mysticism of, of relating in the internal man to God. It's more than just doing the do's and not doing the don'ts. 
Every Christian should have an aspect of Adventism to him, where in one sense he's so much looking forward to the return of Christ that uh, his hope and his affection, his goals are not set upon his existence here in this life. But this business of these three steps in this order of reject, separate, and escape, these are the things that cause the neo-evangelicals problems. Of course, they're not in favor of this at all. Let's go back and give ourselves a little more history. In July of 1974, we've already looked at a lot of earlier history of the founding of NAE, CT, ETS, Fuller Seminary, and so forth from 1942 to 1956. We didn't give you really very many things, probably nothing, more in modern times. In July of 1974, um, a World Congress was held on the subject of evangelization. It was entitled the International Congress on World Evangelization at uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. Lake Geneva in Switzerland. You ever heard of the Lausanne Conference? I'm sure you have. It was another thing that did a lot to to shape or to modify current evangelical church history. 1974 was the year I was being saved, as a matter of fact. So it was a very important year. <laughs> if for nothing else I was saved, I don't care much about what happened over in Switzerland. 2,700 participants from 150 nations joined together under this slogan, let the earth hear his voice. Now you know that you can't even have a congress or a conference if you don't have a slogan to go with it. You know, like Albany last year, what was it? One that the world may be one. O-N-E-W-O-N. Well, you've got to have that. Let the earth hear his voice. They had, first of all, three introductory sessions. I'll give you a little history of Lausanne. Lausanne really changed matters. Three introductory sessions. The first session was on the purpose of God, where papers were delivered, talks, speeches were given. Second session was on the authority of Scripture. Third session was on the uniqueness of Christ. All of that's fine with us. It'd be fine with fundamentalists so far. Then they had two important sessions that concluded matters. The fourth one was the nature of evangelism. And remember, this was called the International Congress on World Evangelization. The nature of evangelism. But then why we're pointing this out is the fifth and the final rallying message, the one that was delivered before you know, the plenary session here. And it was entitled Christian Social Responsibility. Christian Social Responsibility. And of course, a formal covenants and contracts were drawn up after this, stating the position of the delegates represented at Lausanne, Switzerland. And just to give you a small quote from this fifth session, the plenary one on Christian social responsibility, um, it, it declares that, quote, evangelism and sociopolitical involvement are both part of our Christian duty. Evangelism and sociopolitical involvement are both part of our Christian duty. And they drew up this very interesting um, set of distinctions here. One found in this paper called social service, and the other called social action. And they gave um, comparisons and contrasts between what Christians had normally, a after reading the Bible, how they would normally interpret it under certain social services and how 
Luzon was going to go a step further and take the so social service over into the arena of social action. Now, I'm sure you don't understand what I'm saying, but you will when I give you examples. For instance, they said that the old position under social service was um, relieving human need. Relieving human need. And over here under social action, maybe I better just read these to you instead of trying to write all of them. Social action was removing the causes for human need. So you can, you can draw a line here between these two as they're doing right here. You can end up with two different groups of people. Those who believe in social service, which is where our group fits. We believe in relieving human need, wherever human need can be found of relieving it. We don't believe in this next step, which is the, the parallel for the social actionist removing the causes for human need. That's because we've got a lot of different views about a lot of different matters. One, we've got a different view of the inborn sinfulness of man. We've got a different view of politics and religion. We've got a different view of the millennium. We don't believe that it's possible to remove the causes for human need. And certainly it's not possible to remove, listen to that, the causes of human need by marching on City Hall. Human needs, the, the human needs of mankind are spiritual, not financial not not uh, educational not social they're spiritual the second thing listed under social service philanthropic activity philanthropic activity philanthropy you know, good, good financial deeds done. Philanthropy. Philanthropic activity. Social action parallel. Political and economic activity. See, philanthropy might just be, you know, a rich man giving some money to somebody. It's different when you start getting involved in political, official political and economic activity. Maybe this third will even explain it a little better. Social service, the third one there. Seeking to minister to individuals and families. Now that has been the position of the church down through the years. Is Christians on an individual basis would seek to minister to other individuals or families as they have need. Over into social action, seeking to transform the structures of society almost sounds like Marxism in here seeking to transform this is what the neo evangelicals believe seeking to transform the structures of society don't you hear all the time haven't you heard in the past radio programs television programs everyone's wanting to get us involved in political activity as Christians they're always talking about us being the silent majority the silent majority, that there's a majority of born-again Christians, there's a majority of evangelicals here, but we're silent. We have not taken our, our political call seriously enough. And, of course, the, the people like ourselves don't believe we have such a political call. That's why we are silent. So silent is fine. Um, majority, I would disagree with. I don't think there's a majority of evangelicals out there, people who are truly born again, who are going to have the impact they're saying. But you're hearing all the time, more in the last, you know, in recent years than you've ever heard before, oh, of get involved in politics, sign petitions, get your church involved, and always beating you on the head by saying, we're the ones who have the truth, we're Christians, we shouldn't be pushed back into a corner by the world. Jesus sent us out here as missionaries to change the world. And so we've got to do something to change it. And, and, but they're using different methods and different means than the early church used to change it. Of course, they've lost all hope in any supernatural or miraculous in the practical area. Doctrinally, they're fine there, but they've lost all experience in that area. So how can you change the world? But through politics, through educational, economic, social reform. It's always reform, reformation, not regeneration. 
seeking to transform the structures of society. And of course, it's no surprise that here in the same time context, you've got Vatican II, 1962 to 65, You've got liberation theology that came as a result. That's a Roman Catholic phenomenon that came as a result of Vatican II. And all of that kind of has um, overtones, to me anyway, of Marxism to it. And here we've got evangelicals at Lausanne with the same overtones of Marxism seeking to transform the structures of society. I'll give you some more about that later. But one thing that can't even be argued, and, and the, these people won't argue this, can't be argued that the early church didn't try to transform the structures of society. Jesus said, if Caesar, if he made the money, then pay your taxes to Caesar. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. Don't try to change Caesar's into God's. See, you're confusing the whole issue then. Render to Caesar to Caesar to God to God. Let there be the division that should exist. The church of our day is saying, no, let's transform Caesar's palace into the church or the synagogue of Christ. Of course, it will never work. But if you're post-mill, though, according to your theology, it will work because the world's going to get better and better and better. You'll always hear me mention that. It's different components make up what your worldview is, the, way you, the, the lenses, the glasses through which you view the world and your existence in it. And one very important one that we'll discuss later is one's millennial theology. Millennial theology is not just one of these side issues. Well, you're post-mill, on-mill, pre-mill. It doesn't make any difference. Christ is coming or he did come or has come or he is here something's going to happen but it doesn't really make any difference oh but it does it makes all the difference in the world when he's coming when the millennium fits in relation to when he's coming and what you believe about that whole matter as i hope i can demonstrate later pre-mill is just not an option pre-mill is not just an eschatological theology premillennialism is going to affect your entire theology from start to finish the way you view the old testament for sure because we're talking about the relationship between Israel and the church. The way you view social involvement and social action. If you have any hope or suspicion in your mind, and a lot of people do, that if we silent Christians, we majority out here, can simply get our foot in the door, be elected to public offices, we can change the world, we can better the world. If you have any hope in that, you're going to attempt that. If I had any hope in it, I guess I'd try it. But my theology dictates to me otherwise, you see. My theology says it doesn't matter what I do, I cannot improve the world through political or economic or educational methods. That simply is not possible. But you see, why do I believe that? It's because I have a certain theology that I feel is based on the Scripture. They have another theology that they feel is based on the Scripture, and that dictates why they do the things they do and live the way that they do. And then the fourth thing, social service. Works of mercy. Works of mercy. Christians should be involved in works of mercy, social service. You have a neighbor who you know they, they don't have money to pay their electric bill. Well, you've got to help them somehow if it's January. As a Christian, you can't just stand oblivious to the need that they have. There are other things to take into consideration. We discussed that some other... And by the way, here's a good place to say, remember, I said when we started this study that it's almost impossible to know where to draw the line between talking about worldliness and social action and involvement. Although I'm doing the best to mar the line between the two, I'm not intending really to do that. We're going to keep them separate and talk, talk about social action and social involvement later. Because it's not just a blanket across the board thing. If you find a person who has a need, help them. Because the Bible has a lot to say about laziness and sluggishness. The Bible does not expect us to help someone when they have the wherewithal. They could go out and get a job if they want a job. And because they're lazy, because they're slothful, they simply choose not to. Slothfulness along with what? Pride and dishonesty? If I remember my... Dis, get an E in there where it's supposed to go. and Slothfulness. You know, you've heard of the seven great sins of book of proverbs you know well these are bart's three great sins carl bart said the three chief sins of mankind he's probably pretty close to it here are pride dishonesty and slothfulness i think he's probably right three chief sins of mankind pride <laughs> dishonesty and slothfulness but that's not bible that's bart um works of mercy so if a person's slothful then I don't feel I've got any responsibility to help them out except to point out their slothfulness to them. 
There are people who have genuine needs, in other words, and there are people who really don't have a genuine need. They, ha they created their own need. That's their own fault. That's their own mistake. They'll have to deal with that themselves. But that's getting off the subject this morning. The parallel and social action column, the quest for justice. The quest for justice. All of this back to July 1974 with their big problem, the people who believe in this business, let me get this up here again, of reject, separate, and escape. Now, they went a little further. In the summer of 1982, the summer of 1982, We've got a, another meeting. This time it takes place in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. It becomes known as uh, Creaser, C-R-E-S-R, -E an acronym for Consultation on the Relationship Between Evangelism and Social Responsibility. Acronyms always come in handy. Creaser. Consultation on the relationship between evangelism and social responsibility. This was at Grand Rapids. I believe this was in June of 1982. It was under the joint sponsorship of the Lausanne Committee and the World Evangelical Fellowship. Consultation on the relationship between evangelism and social responsibility. This consultation then issued its report entitled Evangelism and Social Responsibility and Evangelical Commitment. And it is in what has now become known as the Grand Rapids Report that you actually find the very minute distinctions between social service and social action, the things that I've just given to you. Uh, one fella states that, um, well, after asking several questions, what then is the biblical basis for social concern? Why should Christians get involved? In the end, there are only two possible attitudes that Christians can adopt towards the world. One is escape, and the other is engagement. So said John Stott. One is escape, one is engagement. Well, we would um, vehemently beg to differ with that. There are more than two attitudes that one can adopt toward the world. According to his terminology of escape and engagement because as we mentioned earlier the mystics the Adventists want to go through these three steps of reject separate escape the neo-evangelicals want to engage we've got two options the escapists and those who want to engage but I would say that there is a third option and this is the biblical one reject separate reject, separate. There's the subtle distinction between the extremes of the world deniers, people such as the mystics and the Adventists who go a step further, reject, separate, and escape. It's not the biblical view and it's not our position that we should try to escape from the world because there seem to be too many scriptures that speak contrary to that of escaping from the world, but that we reject do not love the world. 1 John 2.15, that sounds like rejection for me. Separation, don't be unequally yoked together. 2 Corinthians 6.14, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12.2, in but not of the world. John 17, you get all those scriptures together like that and I think that we've got to have at least this, reject and separate. And they would probably then, instead of calling us mystics or Adventists, we would be the pessimists 
You know, the mystics look to the world above, the Adventists look to the world ahead, the pessimists look to the world behind. Oh, I wish it was back in the good old days. Well, that's not an exactly true caricature of us either. But I think that you could call us pessimists as long as you preceded it with optimists. <laughs> we're, we're very pessimistic about the, about the world. I mean, you can't do anything for the world. We're all, the world that rejects Christ is lost, but yet we're very optimistic because we know Christ is going to come and set things right again. Amen. We, we know we're optimistic. I'm optimistic about the world. It's going to be burned up. And a new world is going to be here, so I'm optimistic. Yeah. But notice there's pessimism in that, too. It's going to be burned up. <laughs> we're, we're not going to change it down at City Hall or something. Maybe I should have put optimism after pessimism or something. Something <laughs> bad is going to happen. Things are going to get worse before things get better. And, um, and they don't like that view at all. Because what they argue, and rightfully so, that stifles social involvement. You're exactly right. Amen. Yep. If you've got this view of pessimism here, it's going to stifle social involvement. You're exactly right. That's our whole point. That's the point they don't like. But rather than trying to pick us apart biblically, they like to name us things. No one likes to be called a pessimist. Someone with a gray cloud on left shoulder or right shoulder all the time. That's kind of a bad term. Optimist is a good person. A pessimist is a bad person. Well, that's not always true. You could be on the right side biblically on occasions and be the pessimist in the group and not the optimist. They like to name us a pessimist and then let the word do its um, leavening, dirty work for us then. With, without arguing biblically with us, just call us a pessimist. You want to look to the world behind. You're a restorationist, old for the good old days. I wish we were back when Jesus were here, the apostles were here or something. And, and you're afraid to just deal with the world right ahead of you. Well, it's not that I'm afraid to deal with the world. It's that I think God tells me not to deal with the world, not in the way in which they are saying. Anyway, back to what our crit critics say about Gnosticism. You'll see how all this ties together. It's still all the same message, Gnosticism. Gnostics are the dualists who make the distinction. We're wanting to reject the world. That means we're calling anything that's matter out there evil. And all we want to do is, is something spiritual. We call spirit good and we call matter evil. Spirit's good, flesh is evil. They say the two big biblical proofs against Gnosticism are, and I think that they're right, as far as Gnostic dualism is concerned, they've got two big proofs. Creation... We've given you this before in studying Gnosticism. I haven't given you the second one, but I've given you this one. What are we saying when we say that creation is one of the big proofs against the heresy of Gnostic dualism? Well, God is spirit, right? And if their, if their differentiation holds true to the very end, spirit's always good, matter's always evil, how could God, who is spirit, ever dirty his hands with creation? Creation is about making matter, things, flesh, bodies, plants, rocks, and things. So creation, the very act of creation, is a big proof against Gnostic dualism. What's the second big proof? What is the? Okay, let's go a little bit earlier. That's true, but we've got to start it earlier. The incarnation. Some people call it, by the way, Stott calls it redemption, but I think most people would say incarnation. That gets the whole picture in here then. God. God, who is pure, perfect spirit, became flesh. See, that's the issue. Once he's flesh and he dies, that's not so much the issue on the cross. It's God, whose pure spirit, became flesh. I would agree with him. Those are the, my two big, most evangelicals, two big proofs against Gnostic dualism. is creation and incarnation. So, what they say is that we are denying the message or the meaning of, of these two things, creation and incarnation, by being world deniers. If we're so rabidly anti-world and anti-worldliness, you know, aren't we denying the very thing, A, which God made, and B, into which Christ came that he might redeem? They become, at this point, very sophisticated with some of their arguments. Go ahead and give you something from Stott again. Christian pessimists concentrate. Uh, he's good here. 
And he's right. Christian pessimists concentrate on the fall. He said, that is, human beings are incorrigible. If you know someone's incorrigible, you throw up your hands and you don't even try. He said, well, you pessimists, you're concentrating on the fall, and there's something else you, con you concentrate on, the consummation. In other words, you're people who look back and look ahead, the consummation, and that tells you, as I just said a moment ago, that one day Christ will come and set everything in order. He said, you, you pessimists, Christian pessimists, concentrate on the fall, human beings are incorrigible, and on the consummation, Christ is coming to put things right. And they imagine that these truths justify social despair. But they overlook, he argues, the creation and, as Sister Anderson used, redemption. I would use incarnation, though. But I know what he means by that. He means incarnation. They overlook creation and redemption. You, you, you understand the, the thought pattern here, what he's getting at. If we're such rabidly anti-worldly type people, then we're denying the very thing that God made and the thing into which Christ came, lowered himself into it to redeem it. And now we're saying, forsake the world, reject the world, separate from the world. Christ didn't do that. He came into the world to save the world. And they love that argument creation and the incarnation. Let me read some more from Stott. The divine image in mankind has not been obliterated. Human beings, though evil, can still do good, as Jesus plainly taught in Matthew 7, 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, that's a good, that's a classic text in theology, Matthew 7, 11, to teach that the image of God has not been obliterated in the fall. Because he very specifically said, if you then, being evil, know how to do good. The evidence of our eyes confirms it. There are non-Christian people who have good marriages, non-Christian parents who bring their children up well, non-Christian industrialists who run factories on a just basis, and non-Christian doctors who still take the Hippocratic standards as their guide and are conscientious in the care of their patients. So what are you arguing for? What are you arguing in favor of, a non-Christian world then? I mean, to emphasize that so much, you're not emphasizing the distinctiveness of Christianity then by saying, hey, there are a lot of lost people out there in the world who are equally good, who can do good things. Jesus said they could, Matthew 7, 11. Therefore, what we're almost back to here is this one great universalism that we all somehow are in God's kingdom. And that kind of blends in with post-millennial theology, although, most, although some of these guys are not post-mill. It blends in well. This is partly because the truth of God's law was written on all human hearts. Well, that's true. And partly because the values of God's kingdom, when embodied in the Christian community, are often recognized and to some extent in imitated by people outside it. In this way, the gospel has borne fruit in Western society over many generations. Man, I wouldn't call that bearing fruit in the church. <laughs> All we have there is the unconscious adopting by much of the Western world of the religion of Christianity. Amen. That because we Christians have what we have, he said that um, uh, many people have imitated this. And in this way, the gospel has borne fruit in Western society. I don't call that bearing fruit. I call that deadly inoculation that we've talked about before that Western society has been inoculated. You know what that is. You get just a dose of something that prevents you from ever further getting the real thing. Western culture, civilization has been inoculated by Christianity, and they are now immune to it. Amen. We're producing results of making, you know, maybe an, an industrialist who he doesn't believe in God or Jesus or anything, but he has been, his mores, his religion, they have been affected by Christian culture around him. Well, I wouldn't deny that. But I'm saying that's worthless in the final analysis, though. How we're affecting, how we're affecting culture in that sense. There is all the difference in the world between the unconscious acceptance of Judeo-Christian principles, 
which is what most of Western society has done, the unconscious acceptance of Judeo-Christian principles. We gave you some of those earlier, theistic view of God who's intelligent and intelligible, the dignity of man, of human life, inborn sinfulness, the traditional monogamous family, common decency, the work ethic. Those have imbued Western culture and society, but it has done so unconsciously though. And so it's not enough for us to argue, praise God, at least we're all being unconsciously affected by the shadow of the cross. That's not enough. There's, a, there's all the difference in the world between the unconscious acceptance of those things because they're simply inherited and the personally thought out embracing of them. That is what makes a true believer. That is the thing that will affect anybody if anything will affect someone else. So that's what we're after here. The personally conscious thought out embracing of the fundamental mores of Western thought and culture. See, Western culture is traditionally monogamous. That has been the position for years and years and years. It has somewhat changed recently, but still many people who have never darkened the door of a church philosophically are monogamous. They belong to that position. They think that is the right way. Where do, where do they get that? Well, he's arguing, and he's right here. Part of it's due to the law of God on man's heart. Part of it's due to unconscious Christian influence. And so what they're after is that, see, since we have influenced them, let's go out and get involved even more and we can influence them more. But all we're doing are, is inoculating Western society, though. We're not converting anyone. If anything, we're weakening down we, we are losing the hope of ever making a conversion. And, and we know that is true. We have gone out and yeah. witnessed the people. Wow. Well, I've got that. I believe that. Yep. I mean, that's the whole shock about the matter. Yep. They already know about that. They already believe that. There's nothing wrong in their life. You try to tell someone you're a sinner. You are a sinner in the sight of God. They say, well, I'm not any worse than you are. You sin in your life, too. They can't even comprehend doctrines of grace or predestination or salvation. But they have been inoculated by just the thought and the spirit of Christianity so that we're kind of all in this great universal church together. Amen. That's why there is no way I'm going to fall for this neo-evangelical argument here. You're bringing us right into Marxism, into universalism, and you don't even know what you're doing. This message will be continued.